Good morning. Y'all ready? All right, here we go. I now call to order the first general session of the 58th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Are the delegates ready to do the business of this association? Unsatisfactory. <laughs> Board member and vice moderator Denise Rhymes will give us our opening words this morning. As we begin our important work of the day, uh, these are our opening words from Connie Simon. This is the hour. The time has come. Mindful of our responsibilities as leaders of this faith and guardians of this living tradition, we call upon that great cloud of witness, those who came before, those who are here now, and those who have yet to come. We seek their presence, their love, and their support in this place at this hour. We kindle this flame to light their path and call them near as we undertake this sacred work. We have a couple of announcements for us this morning. One, for those of you that are sighted and on site, if you look around you, you will see some fabulous human beings wearing beautiful green and white or red and white striped vests. Those folks are our ushers and our tellers. They sometimes will ask you to move from a place that you are because the space you're in has been reserved for a particular group of people or person or we are not in compliance with our fire regulations. They do it with love, and we ask that you receive their requests with love. When we get to our business voting and discussing, we have off-site delegates. There is a slight time delay between what we experience here in the hall and what they experience online. And so we ask for your patience as that lag happens so that we can be assured that in our full opportunities of democracy, we are including all who are participating. For our last announcement, which is slightly personal, I would love to be able to stay in the room with you today, which means as much as you love your oranges and your grapefruits and your rose water and your roses, if you could not open them or put them on, that would be so great, otherwise I'm leaving for good. <laughs> and so I'm really allergic to citrus, um, and so I really appreciate it, like anaphylaxis shock-wise. Um, and so it's actually not a joke. <laughs> so if you could please do that, it'd be really great. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <laughs> do we have a report from the right relationship team or safety team? Good morning, all. It's good to be here with you. I'm the Reverend Sherry Halliday Kwan. And I'm Yadani Hailu. Our report is brief this morning. We come from across the continent and beyond, from many cultures and backgrounds, and discovering those cultural differences is often fun. And then there are the instances that remind many of us here that this faith and this place, this gathering, is seen as a time and a space that is meant for some and not for others. We've had a variety of reports come to us over the last day that range from small microaggressions, surely things that were well-intentioned, and other larger structural problems. We've heard stories of experiences that range from unsolicited comments about the appropriateness of people's lipstick choices and clothing 
as well as exuberant welcomes that communicate to the young, black, brown, indigenous, queer, or trans person that for the person welcoming them, it is clear that this faith is not seen as theirs, but as something that they're welcomed into as a guest. Let us assume that if we're all here in this hall, having gone through the registration process and the daily hassle of navigating these somewhat confusing halls, that we are not only meant, not only meant to be here, but that we meant to be here. I'd like to remind everyone that scooter users' space includes the scooter. That's not public space, and I ask you to allow people to exit the hall and move without you cutting in front of them if you happen to be someone who's walking. Please don't arrange the furniture in rooms. Those were designed specifically with accessibility in mind. And along these lines, I want to share an event from yesterday. There was one session, rather popular, where the presenters rearranged the room in a circle and in doing so shut out scooter users. It was an unintentional oversight, and when made aware of this, their response was clear. They apologized, changed the chairs back, and committed to do better in the future. With gratitude to those presenters, and apologies and gratitude for those who raised their concerns and simply wanted to access this space that was already for all of us, let us all commit to doing better in the future. Let us begin now. Our next piece of business is to review and adopt our rules of procedure. If you are a delegate on site, this means you're going to need your orange voting card. The proposed rules of procedure can be found on pages 64 through 66 of the final agenda and program book. These rules will govern our consideration of and voting upon the business items that come before us during our general session. The rules are largely the same as in previous years. There are a couple of items that I want to direct your attention to. Please note that Rule 5 provides that no amendments to a business resolution, bylaw change, or rule change will be in order unless submitted for consideration at the mini-assembly for that item, which was yesterday. So work on time travel. Also, please note that Rule 6B indicates that 30 minutes is allowed for discussion of any proposed bylaw or rule amendment, resolution, or action on a report that is on or admitted to the final agenda. The specific change states that the time includes time devoted to discussing any amendments to the proposed amendment. Any motion to extend time for debate must be made from the procedural microphone, this one right here in front of me before the debate expires. This is an adjustment that simply clarifies the rule. Additionally, Rule 6C, clarifications have been made to explicitly include off-site delegates and adjust time limits if there are no speakers at the pro or concern microphones regarding calling of the question. As a reminder, Rule 7 provides that separate microphones will be designated as pro and concern for discussions of proposed bylaw amendments, rules, resolutions, or actions. The pro mic is up front to my left. The concern mic is up front to my right. There's also an amendment microphone, which has been placed in the front area. There we go, magical lights and of course the procedural microphone right in front of me. Please note that points of personal privilege and points of information must be made from the procedural mic and not from the pro or concern mics, nor the amendment mic. By the way, only delegates may speak from the microphones except by express permission of a co-moderator or whomever is moderating the debate of the moment. I strongly urge those of you who are attending General Assembly for the first time 
to read and review the rules of procedure. Particularly, look at Rule 6 on page 64 of the rules so that you understand the time limits in effect. No person may speak on any motion for more than two minutes. 30 minutes is the time allowed for discussion of any proposed bylaw amendment, rule change, resolution, or action on a report that is on or admitted to the final agenda. Before proceeding with further business, I want to introduce you to Tom Bean, our legal counsel. And Nina Elgo, our parliamentarian. They help make sure we do things properly. That said, will the board secretary make the appropriate motion with respect to the rules of procedure? Thank you. Before we can do this piece of business, we need to know that we are entitled to do the business. Therefore, I am pleased to report to you that at this time, there are 2,625 people registered and present in some form for this General Assembly. This year, we have 202 off-site delegates with a total of 1,375 delegates representing 495 congregations from all 50 states, Washington, D.C., two Canadian provinces, and Mexico. We have therefore substantially exceeded all the numbers set forth in Section 410 of the bylaws of the Unitarian Universalist Association, and so I confirm that we have quorum. Moved that the rules of procedure of this General Assembly as set forth in full on pages 64 through 66 of the final agenda be adopted. Is there a second? Does anyone want to discuss the rules? Seeing no one moving for discussion, we do have somebody off-site. I believe this might be premature, um, but I'm going to read for Sally, sorry, Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian Church, Paramus, New Jersey. I request that we remove the consent agenda. I'm going to stop you right there. Sally, I'm sorry, that's not part of the rules. Let's hang on to that. Further discussion? Seeing none, hearing none, we're ready to vote. All those in favor of adopting the rules of procedure, please do so by raising your voting cards or voting online. I'm going to just give it a sec for the off-site delegates to get their votes in. Those in the hall, feel free to lower your cards. All right, passes with an overwhelming majority. The motion carries, and we have rules and procedures. Sarah Dan. Thanks for joining us on stage. I'm happy to join you. Good morning, friends. Good morning, friends. There we have it. We got to get those lungs moving. My friends, I want to sing a little bit with you before we start our business day because I find it most important for us to breathe. So I'm going to ask you to take a breath with me. And out. So when I wrote Meditation on Breathing, Breathe In, Breathe Out, it was in response to the events of September 11th. And since then, I've heard all kinds of stories about people using singing 
believing in meditation on breathing. Everything from parents and their kids to two fellows who bought some pygmy goats and they wanted to calm them down in the back seat as they were transporting them back to their house. That's a true story. It's in three parts. You may sing whatever part resonates with you. You may sing no parts. You may sing all of the parts. But I'm just going to invite you to sing. I'm also going to invite you to rise in body or spirit. It's a long day of sitting. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in together. you to take a breath and think before you speak. <laughs> what are you saying, Sarah Dan? <laughs> we are gathered during a time of great struggle and great possibility in our faith movement and in our larger world. Our theme for this General Assembly, the power of we, speaks to the moment we find ourselves in. In recent years, the Unitarian Universalist movement has been wrestling with who we are. The word we draws a circle around a group of people. We have been asking ourselves, where have we drawn that circle? Who is included in it and who is not? Who have we placed at the center of the circle? and who has been pushed to the margins. Our movement has been grappling with what it means when everyone within the circle of our faith, those in the center and those at the margins, has a valued voice and a place at the table. And we've been exploring what it means to pay attention more deeply to the perspectives of those who have been pushed to the margins or outside the circle for the majority of our movement's history. We've been learning how doing this grows our collective power, grows the power of we. It doesn't feel like a coincidence that next week, or this week, is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. On June, 
On June 28, 1969, those who were most oppressed, trans women, drag queens, people of color, young folks living on the street, fought back against police brutality. As the uprising grew and spilled out of the Stonewall Inn, they were joined by friends and allies, now accomplices, in the streets of Greenwich Village. Together they said collectively, we are powerful. It also doesn't feel like a coincidence. This is also the 50th anniversary of the walkout of the 1969 General Assembly by representatives of the Black Affairs Council and their supporters. In the midst of what Jean Ott called the white controversy, over black empowerment. Hmm. <laughs> Reverend Dr. Mark Morrison Reed helps us remember that the walkout was a moment when, to those present, it felt like Unitarian Universalism might divide permanently. These events 50 years ago changed the denomination that was overwhelmingly white and straight and cisgendered to not just be engaged in the fight for queer and trans and black liberation but to also recognize queer and trans and black people as we, as Unitarian Universalists and as leaders. They charged us to respect and follow the leadership of black and brown trans women like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, and black UUs like Mrs. Lincoln Sedinga, formerly known as Hayward Henry Jr. and Whitney M. Young Jr. As queer and genderqueer leaders, we honor the prophetic elders and ancestors within the overlapping black, queer, and UU movements who made our very lives possible and gave us the chance to bring our gifts forward and to serve as your co-moderators, the highest volunteer leadership position in this faith. We both came of age in a UU movement that was informed by this history and they're charged to honor the leadership of people of color, queer folks, and trans folks. We lead a little differently than those who came before us because of being steeped in this charge as young people. We mourn the fact that our movement has not always recognized queer, trans, people of color, UUs, youth, and young adults as full members and respected leaders. We mourn those who have left and honor those who have stayed. When we do move the margins to the center and fully value the leadership and contributions of those who have been marginalized within our movement, people of color, queer and trans people, disabled people, low-income people, young people, and others, amazing things happen. This, this is what your board has strived to do this year. For example, new understandings and practices of accountability are emerging as we explore how to ensure that our institutions and covenanted communities are accountable to the needs of all of us. This has included refining the board's conflict of interest practices and working with UUA staff and our affiliated and partner organizations to create a shared ethics board and a revamped national advisory committee. It has meant making adjustments to the moderator position and the election process, as well as the pipeline for the appointments and nominating committees. And it has meant working toward modernizing the UUA bylaws to make them more liberating. All these things have benefited from the diverse perspectives of the leaders involved. But it's also important to pay attention to the impacts and really the cost of leadership for those who are most marginalized. All leaders, particularly volunteer leaders, make sacrifices and commitments of time, energy, and other resources. But for leaders with target or marginalized identities, the impacts are disproportionately costlier. To use ourselves as an example, serving as co-moderators has meant lost wages, lost vacation, and lost rest due to spending all of our available time or our time off from our full-time jobs on our moderator duties. It means extra exhaustion from managing expectations and demands of us based on our identities. It means isolation from our communities of support due to perceptions of conflict of interest or the boundaries of the moderator role itself. 
we are not always respected or accepted as authorities in the ways previous moderators have been. And this means fulfilling our duties takes extra work and extra toll. Sometimes the costs are too great. We deeply mourn the fact that Trustee Christina Riviera felt the need to resign from the board due to the disproportionate cost of being a leader with a target identity. In her case, these costs included death threats that extended beyond herself to her children, which is completely unacceptable. Every time a leader leaves for any reason, it leaves a void. We mourn the death of Dick Jackie and the resignation of Tim Atkins this past year, and we will deeply miss Latifah Woodhouse and Vice Moderator Denise Rhymes for cycling off the board after this DA. But no one should have to leave because of the violence and impact of bigotry and foolishness. Dismantling systems of <laughs> Dismantling systems of oppression within our movement means doing things differently. It takes more than different leaders. It also takes different leadership structures, culture, and different ways of doing things. It takes trying things and failing and figuring out what to do differently. It takes slowing down evaluating what we are trying, and valuing the, pro valuing the process, not just the outcome. So as co-moderators, we've tried some things, some have gone well, and some haven't. Having two moderators is something that hasn't been tried before. On the positive side, it's not about having two people at the helm instead of one. It's about modeling shared leadership and fully believing that all members of the board can lead in some way. It's been a joy to be part of a board that is led by us all. You can see it in all the committee work, the shared facilitation, the reports during board meetings, and so many other ways, especially the fact that we discuss before we vote, like a day apart. It really helps. On the challenging side, your board has helped that two moderators would mean being able to share the work. But this hasn't always worked. For example, <laughs> the systems of our denomination and the people in them are used to having one person who knows and shares all. They aren't prepared for only one of us to attend a call or a meeting or a gathering. So what should be an advantage sometimes is not because our structures haven't been set up for shared leadership. It's up to all of us to change the structures that aren't serving our faith and our values. It's up to all of us to try new things, to take risks, and to engage with each other in different ways. Our power is not individual, but collective. It's not top-down, but collaborative. Instead of, searching, instead of searching for authority to blame, let's own our own agency, get to know each other more deeply, and work together to make changes. Instead of thinking of changes like co-leadership or new governance models as magic pills that will either work immediately or should be discarded whole value, let's take the time for assessment and improvement in line with our highest values. Please take seriously the power of we this week and your place in our collective we. Being part of this faith isn't about I or me, it's about we. As a covenantal faith, we need one another, and we need to be in dialogue with one another to live our faith collaboratively, not in individualism and isolation. Last year's General Assembly dipped a toe into a different way of doing governance. This year, we are moving closer to a general conference that allows for collaborative theological discernment about where we are going as a faith. This collaboration begins an active involvement in the theme, in the two theme programs and conversation sessions, today from 1.30 to 4 and tomorrow from 9 a.m. to noon. Please take these sessions seriously. Fully engage in them from a place of care and attention to our collective we. We are continuing to build toward a full general conference next year 
where we will continue these conversations and decisions about our bylaws, what it means for us to dismantle oppression and white supremacy within our denomination and world, our UU principles, and who we are called to be now and for the future. We are counting on each of you to keep showing up and engaging deeply in these conversations. Before we move on, we want to give voice to the urgency of leaning into this moment together as a movement. We are sitting at the precipice of something beautiful, incredible, and radical in this faith. We must allow it to happen and not let fear and distrust of change be our God. <laughs> I encourage you to listen to Leslie Takahashi's Barry Street Lecture uh, and the FOSS by Mama Paula Cole Jones to like ground in what we are talking about. There are a couple of places in my life that feel like home. One is Cedartown, Florida, where my dad's family is from, my great aunt who's 94 years ago. When I step on that soil, especially at that little church graveyard where so many of my ancestors are buried, I feel their struggle, dreams, and joy rise up in me. The second is my church home, Tennessee Valley UU Church, that grew me up and helped mold me to the person in front of you today. The third is the Highlander Research and Education Center, a place I started going to as a child and was blessed to work at for over 11 years. Highlander was firebombed by an alt-right neo-Nazi group in April when I was at a ministerial fellowship committee meeting. They burned down our office, a lot of our archives, and left a huge neo-Nazi sign, sign next to the burning building. Now I've gone through a lot, y'all. I've been ran off the road, shot at, <laughs> had my picture and address and car posted on every neo-Nazi site in the country. But that bombing brought me to the core. We are living in a time when white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, transphobia, and the alt-right is on the rise. The question is, how will we respond as a faith movement? We are also living in a time when many social justice organizations say and do externally does not match up with how they operate internally. I would venture to say a lot of our churches move very similarly. Deliverables matter more than the care for the people involved or the impact the work has. It is meaningless, let me say it again, it is meaningless for organizations and movements to claim to be about change in the world and then operate in oppressive ways in terms of staffing, how decisions are made, and how people are treated. The reason why most young people leave our faith is because of the hypocrisy. If you, are, if you are raised up to think a thing, then you go and experience something else, why would you say? There's no need. It's hypocritical. We have to do better than this. We have to decide right now what kind of movement of faith we want to be. Are we ready to take bold risks that might feel scary, but enable us not to just say beautiful things in the world, not just be ready at the rally, but embrace the fundamental shifts and transformations necessary inside our congregations or organizations in the UUA and out in the world in our partner work? Are we ready to reimagine what ethics mean and what being a sanctuary looks like for my anti-oppressive anti-colonial and anti-domination space? Are we ready to be on the side of love, not just when it's convenient to wear our yellow shirts, but when it's inconvenient and causes us headaches and keeps us up at night? We need to be ready, y'all. It's time for us to go all in and be the movement that Barb and I were taught as you use them as children. It's time to do religious education for everybody and not just go to church and hear the sermon, so maybe we can all be on the same page. It's time for us to put care of each other first, the impact we want to have in the world next, and then the deliverables third, because you put the care and the impact first, the deliverables will come. We must truly, fully, and unapologetically live at our values, be the change that we wish to see, and still say righteous and indignation, and not just complacent.
In closing, we want to give our deep thanks to the board. It's been, it's been an honor to serve as your co-moderators. We want to thank our board members who, who cycle off this year. Thanks to Latifa Woodhouse for her year of service on the board, to Chelsea Hendricks and Tanner Linden, our amazing youth observers. Particular thanks are due to Vice Moderator Denise Rimes. Denise, we wouldn't be as successful as we appear, as moderators or as a board, without your support. You have been a steadfast keeper of details and the big picture, while also being a calming presence time and again. We also want to thank the incredibly awesome UUA staff and all they do for our faith. We particularly want to lift up Dr. Jan Sneegis, Pat Kahn, and Tim Brennan. All three are retiring after many years of service. Tim, thank you for the expertise, leadership, and clarity you brought to the CFO position as a UU and your passion for socially responsible investing and shareholder activism. Pat, your work has contributed so much to the education and credentialing of religious educators and music directors. And Jan, we love you. We love Tim and Pat also. But Jan, you have transformed the job of GA and Conference Services Director and yourself in service to our faith. Your passion for imbuing our UU values into every General Assembly while always being the voice of reason and reality is no small feat. Thank you all for the gifts of serving as your co-moderators. Thank you. Section 10.3 of the UA bylaw set forth the following duties of the financial advisor. The amazing financial advisor shall advise the president and the board of trustees on financial policy and shall assist the board in long range planning by reviewing the sources of funds, the application of funds designated for specific purposes, the balance between foreseeable income and proposed expenditures, and the overall financial welfare of the association. From time to time, the financial advisor shall report to the president and board findings and recommendations respecting the current financial affairs of the association and long-range planning. The financial advisor serves on the UA board, listen to all this y'all, the UA board, the health plan board, the retirement plan committee, the social responsible investment committee, the investment committee, and the audit committee. That's a lot. So we love Lucia Santini Field. Please come to the podium. Good morning, everyone. I'm so hopeful I'm not going to fall in front of all of you. It's um, not clear yet whether I will or won't. So I have been very privileged to serve as financial advisor to the UUA and am extremely pleased to report another year of balanced and successful fiscal operations in the numerous, highly complex financial organizations that support the mission of our UUA. The staff leadership team under the inspired, clear, focused, passionate, and compassionate leadership of Reverend Susan Frederick Ray, in combination 
with the UUA Board of Trustees, led more than capably by Alandria Williams and Barb Grieve, continues to ensure that the mission and vision of our faith are centered, while ensuring that revenues and expenses are carefully balanced. Over the past few years, the introduction of a new, more equitable and sustainable formula for congregational commitment to support our faith movement was tested, revised, and implemented widely in the fiscal year just ending. Change takes time, and we're grateful to congregations for their patience with the implementation of the new formula. We ask for your strong, generous congregational support for the new model to support our covenantal work together, and we ask your patience with inevitable questions or issues you or your volunteers or staff encounter. On behalf of the board, I thank you for your flexibility, engagement, and continued commitment to support the work of our faith in this critical time. I am, I am very pleased to report that the significant financial operations of the association and related entities as reflected in the UUA's budget, common endowment fund, retirement plan, health plan, and Beacon Press are all very healthy and well managed and in the hands of competent and experienced staff and overseen by committees of competent and experienced volunteers. I recognize with gratitude for his long and extremely valuable service to our faith, the many contributions of Tim Brennan in his role of, as CFO of our UUA. <laughs> Tim will retire at the end of this fiscal year. He has overseen tremendously positive changes in financial management, investments, control, and reporting, to name just a few. His tireless service, optimism, and humor have made serving with him a great pleasure. Thank you, Tim. You will be missed. I hope all of you will see the short video documenting the UUA's significant corporate activism related to climate change initiatives, which highlights Tim's strategic leadership and commitment to this critical work. As you know, the association has been focused on the important work of dismantling systems of oppression and white supremacy. This critical work for our faith, this is critical work at any time for our faith, and it is long overdue in our faith and our country. We must all commit to learning, self-reflection, and constructive change to support this work. I am very happy to note that all of the financial committees, Investment Committee, Socially Responsible Investment Committee, Health Plan Board, Retirement Plan Committee, and Audit Committee all recognize the pivotal role that money in its many forms plays in sustaining these systems and their, our, the committees and staff together, responsibility for a thoughtful examination of how our work may support or dismantle systems of oppression. I am grateful to the many talented, committed volunteers willing to consider these new questions and new paths. I thank you for your support of Unitarian Universalism. I am thankful for our faith leaders and the, for the commitment of so many to justice and peace for all. Thank you. In our opening ceremony, we taught you We Rise, the movement song by Batya Levine. I'd like to just review your part so you can sing it with a little more vigor and confidence today. It goes like this. Rise. Try that with me. Rise. Beautiful. Sing that again. Rise. More time just like that. Rise. And the fourth one goes up. Rise. Can you sing? 
sing that one for me? Rise. So let's do the whole pattern. Rise. We'll sing that again. Rise. Once more, just like that. Rise. And the last one goes up. Rise. Brilliant. We rise. Humbly hearted. Rise. Won't be divided. Rise. With spirit to guide us. Rise. Let's sing all that again. We rise, humbly hearted, rise. We won't be divided, rise. With spirit to guide us, rise. The second part sounds like this. In hope, in prayer, we find ourselves here. In hope, in prayer, we're right here. Sing with me. In hope, in prayer, we find ourselves here. In hope, in prayer, we're together. We rise, humbly hearted, rise. We won't be divided, rise. With spirit to guide us, It is my distinct pleasure to invite to our podium the Reverend Dr. Susan Frederick Gray, our president of the UUA, to give her annual report. Hello, beloveds, beautiful ones. Oh, what an honor it is to stand in this podium and to see all of you. Oh, well, we are living in difficult and dangerous times. These are not ordinary times in our work as Unitarian Universalists, in our congregations, as leaders, and at the UUA must also not be ordinary. Two themes defined my first year as president. Number one, this is no time for a casual faith. And number two, this is no time to go it alone. Now, these themes shaped my earliest priorities. First, to clarify the UUA's mission and put it at the heart of all we do. And second, to strengthen relationships across our association because when we work together, in relationship focused on mission, we amplify our power as a moral force for love and justice. And right now, together, we have the enormous task of embracing bold institutional change that truly embodies the liberatory values of our faith, a beloved community where all people of all identities thrive.
And so my second year as your president has been about taking this work of mission and relationship and putting systems in place to carry the institutional change work forward for the long haul. Now, describing the work of systems is not glamorous, but it is this daily shovel work that makes the noteworthy moments possible. It is systems that make sure that change efforts last. And one part of this shovel work has been to clarify how do we actually move organizational change? How do systems shift? And this question matters not just to the UUA, but to our congregations that are also seeking to unlock the power, the impact, and the liberatory spirit of our communities. So how do you change the culture of an institution? Well, five things are essential. Number one, a clear mission and vision to name where we are headed and who we are called to be. If you don't know where you're going, anything will do, right? So you've got to be clear about mission and vision. Number two, you need leaders who are committed and invested in that vision. Without leaders who understand and are invested, an organization will not be able to create substantive change. Number three, you need ongoing skill building, because guess what? Change is not just about a mindset. Change requires specific and real skills and ongoing learning and skill development. A learning community is a change community. Number four, accountable relationships beyond the organization, because change cannot come only from within. Partnerships with directly impacted communities root us in the needs of those most impacted by systems of oppression. And then number five, strong relationships within and across the organization. Creating change for the long term requires always developing relationships, always developing leadership, and always developing increasing commitment and the power of we around the mission and vision. So this is the guide that we are using to move institutional change at the UUA. And you'll hear it echoed directly as I dive more deeply into the work of what we've been up to this year. So what comes first? Mission and vision. The UUA's core mission is threefold. Number one, to equip congregations for health and vitality. Number two, to train and support leaders, both lay and professional. And number three, to advance our UU values on a national and international scale. Equipping congregations. This is the work of our congregational life staff who connect, companion, challenge, and coach our congregations. It's resources like Our Whole Lives, Comprehensive Sexuality Education, our Tapestry of Faith curriculum, and our hymnals. It's resourcing ministerial transitions and the UUA pension and health plan that help congregations be good employers. Great news this year, we launched an improved online interface for ministerial search that's making it better for congregations and ministers. And for the second year in a row, we had a zero increase in premiums for the UUA health plan. That is tremendous. That Number two, second part of our mission, training and supporting leaders. That's the work we do to credential religious professionals to provide continuing education and cohort gatherings for religious professionals, lay leaders, and youth and young adults. A brand new resource we launched this year is Leader Lab. Leader Lab is an online resource that has live and on-demand courses on everything from board governance and stewardship to nurturing equity and diversity in congregations. And you can find it at uua.org Leader Lab. In addition, recognizing that we have not taken a holistic look at youth ministry in more than a decade, we are launching a strategic visioning conversation around youth ministry to identify needs and opportunities to strengthen our ministry to and with youth and to keep them in our faith.
Barb and Elandria aren't the only one grown in this faith. Me too. Advancing our UU values is the outward-facing justice work we do to represent Unitarian Universalism to the wider world. It's our international partnerships and advocacy work, and it's our justice work. It's the ministry of the United Nations Office, Side with Love, Love Resists, Congregational Advocacy, and Beacon Press. All of this is possible because of your support for the UUA and your congregation's support through the annual program fund. The UUA is the embodiment of the covenant that our congregations and communities make to each other. When you support the UUA, you are supporting each other as congregations so that all of our congregations have resources, leadership, support in times of crisis, celebration in times of joy. You are nurturing each other when you support the UUA. You are powering the mission of the UUA. And I just want to lift up that congregational support for the UUA is the single largest and most important funding for our core mission. Now, one of the ways I think about mission and vision is that mission keeps us grounded. It reminds us of our core work. But vision, vision helps us soar. Part of the hope for this 2019 General Assembly and the upcoming year is to be in discernment across our association about our vision for Unitarian Universalism, the power of we. Now, while this is in progress, we at the UUA have articulated an operational vision to guide the changes that we must live into at the UUA. Our vision at the UUA is to create a UUA in which the aspirations of Unitarian Universalism as a beloved anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural faith community are reflected. A UUA in which people of color and indigenous people, trans and non-binary folks, people with disabilities, those of all classes, backgrounds, ages, and identities can thrive. And to support our congregations and communities and their leaders, to be sources of justice, equity, compassion, and liberation in your communities. Now, living into this vision is not easy. We've seen very publicly where we as Unitarian Universalists have fallen short of this vision. This year, an article in the UU world caused real harm to transgender and non-binary UUs, their families, their allies. It is an example of the gap between our aspirations and our practice, and it demonstrates how we must do better. Since that article ran, the UU World engaged the leadership of transgender religious professional UUs together, trust, and hired a non-binary Unitarian Universalist to edit a must-read collection. Yes, Teresa Soto. <laughs> edited this collection, a must-read collection of essays from transgender and non-binary UUs. This also sparked conversations that will continue about how the Association's magazine supports the mission of the UUA and how we all live into the practice, one that I learned from equal access, nothing about us without us. Let's all say that. This is so important for how we live and move in the world. Nothing about us without us. Let's remember that as a mantra in our work and how we communicate who we are and which voices we lift up to say who this faith is. Another specific situation at the UUA in congregational life moved us to experiment with restorative circles to address broken relationship and harm. We are all human, and we will break covenant. And therefore, we need restorative practices that help us build the muscles of truth-telling, learning from mistakes, owning responsibility and accountability, and building deeper trust in our communities. 
Finally, for the second year in a row, we have had an increase in complaints regarding professional misconduct. Addressing misconduct is a critically necessary role of the UUA and one that requires deeper investment and comprehensive response systems. This is work we dedicated ourselves to improving many years ago, and we continue to work to make these systems more accessible, transparent, and just, because professional misconduct undermines the power and the liberatory impact and spirit of our faith. In the midst of these mistakes, in the midst of these mistakes and areas of ongoing growth, we have also made important progress on core promises that we made coming out of the disruptions two years ago that called us to dismantle a culture of white supremacy and Unitarian Universalism. Very early in my first year, we implemented new hiring practices aimed at diversity and equity, and I'm pleased to report the impact of these practices. Two years ago, the Leadership Council, which is the senior executive staff of the UUA, was 12% people of color. Today, it is 42% people of color. Two years ago, the UUA staff as a whole was 19% people of color. Today, it is 28% people of color. Today at the UUA, we have identity-based groups for staff of color and indigenous people, for LGBTQ staff, and for trans and non-binary staff. Now, we are not done. This is not over. I am this shows the impact of the changes we've made, but we still have a long way to go, right? But it's a strong move forward. Last year, I reported that we would implement a culture change strategy within the UUA to shift our culture as an organization. And this year, I'm thrilled to share that we have a JEDI team, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, the JEDI team of the UUA. working to identify obstacles to full inclusion that involve power and equity and build the skills we need to create a truly diverse, equitable, and just workplace at the UUA. Last year, I asked you to be part of our commitment to Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism for their groundbreaking ministry individuals, congregations, and UU institutions, including the UUA, we have pledged over $4.3 million for the Promise and the Practice campaign. And this year, at this General Assembly, we are fulfilling our $5 million commitment to blue. significant successes in living into the promise and the practice of who we say we are. But we also know that real change, change that can affect the outcomes for people of color and others staying in our movement and leading this movement, must happen at the congregational level. Right? So here is how the UUA is working to be a strong partner to move change locally. And no surprise, it's all related to mission. Equipping congregations. Last year we said we'd develop resources needed to live into cultural change at the local level. This year, the Faith Development Office created an ever-growing page of resources just for congregations looking to dismantle a culture of white supremacy in your congregation. We also, Faith Development created a white supremacy accountability tool to be used to review congregational religious education programs. 
And this year, the Central East region held a New Day Rising conference that invited leaders from across the region to share their stories of success and failure in dismantling white supremacy culture. We're looking at this model and a way to bring it to more and more areas. Second mission area, training and supporting leaders. Last year, I reported on the unprecedented number of religious professionals of color facing challenges or conflict in their ministry and our commitment at the UUA to provide better support to these leaders. This year, every region of the UUA committed to individualized support for every religious professional of color. And this has taken a variety of forms, including stronger startups, regular check-ins, helping to develop covenants and coaching for ministers of color entering multi-ministry teams. This year, we are improving our records to better track and understand the realities and trends of religious professionals of color so that we can better serve and support these leaders now and into the future. This year, we made stronger and clearer our commitments, including funding for the UUA's Finding Our Way Home Retreat and the annual Trust Retreat. And yesterday, we formalized our relationship and financial support for diverse and revolutionary UU Multicultural Ministries drum. <laughs> We know that investing in the leaders who have historically been marginalized in our faith is the way to bring the margins into the center and to truly change the culture of our faith. Our third core mission area is advancing UU values. Earlier I spoke to how real institutional change requires being in accountable relationship with frontline and fenceline communities. This commitment guides both our justice priorities and how we move them. This year, we clarified four intersectional justice priorities through a strategic review unlike any undertaken in the last 15 years. This strategic review led to the creation of the organizing strategy team because we realized that what is needed to move justice in this country is power, and power is built through organizing. We are shifting our focus to organizing and supporting organizing. The four strategic areas, intersectional justice priorities, are combating criminalization, and that includes mass incarceration and policing, as well as immigrant detention and deportation, climate justice, LGBTQ and gender justice, and electoral organizing. Now, we know that UU congregations are engaged in many different issues and campaigns locally, and this continues. But we also want to model focus and long-term relationship building at the UUA and invite as many people as possible to join us in these four core areas. This year, the UUA supported actions at the border in Arizona and San Diego. We showed up to support Dr. Christine Blasey Ford as she testified during the Kavanaugh hearings at rallies to support reproductive justice and to stand against discrimination targeting LGBTQ people. In November, Unitarian Universalists and the UUA showed up in Florida to help secure the largest voter reenfranchisement since the Voting Rights Act. This is what organizing can do, and this is what our faith community in solidarity with grassroots organizing can do. And then there's Beacon Press. Embracing these pri Beacon Press has embraced these priorities and mission to guide who and what they publish. And the press was on fire this year. Yeah. Woo! As just one example, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo was on the New York Times bestseller list for over six months. <laughs> but it wasn't just that book. All of these and so many titles have been focused on publishing the voices of leaders of color, focus on organizing, fighting criminalization and racism and, and um, climate justice. and. We are seeing the larger community respond to Beacon Press and what they are putting out. It's tremendous. 
All of this is to say that at the UUA, we are making it our mission to be a faith community that responds to the demands of this time. And there is more ahead. This report is by no means comprehensive. These are just a few examples of system shifts and significant wins we've had this year. You can find out more about the work the UUA does through our brand new free publication, the UUA Amplify Catalog, which lists our many programs, resources, and how you can connect them. None of these big changes or the ongoing core, work, core mission work of the UUA would happen without the attention dedication and countless hours of your phenomenal UUA staff, over 200 people who work tirelessly and often fearlessly and certainly faithfully to serve this tradition, our congregations and our leaders. Would you all on UUA staff who are here in the room rise as you are able. Just want everyone to see you and give you a round. me what, what the, my favorite part of my job is, and it is getting to work with the UUA staff. It is a privilege and a pleasure. Behind me, gathered with me, is the Leadership Council of the UUA. These are the strategic partners with me, with their teams, and with many of you who make our mission and our vision come to life. And we are very pleased to welcome a new addition to our team, Mr. Andrew McGeorge, who is the incoming Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer of the UUA beginning July 8th. The CFO and Treasurer have a unique role because they are both a part of the staff and appointed by your UUA board. So welcome, Andrew. And I finally want to offer my sincerest gratitude for our outgoing Treasurer and CFO, Tim Brennan. In Tim's 13 years, he's increased the financial health and management of the UUA's resources and made us a leader in socially responsible investing and corporate accountability. And I mean, I just want to lift up one thing. Tim has said yes to mission. Tim has worked closely with Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism over this year. I mean, Tim's commitment as the, one of the key financial leaders of our faith in saying yes to dismantling white supremacy culture and getting focused on mission has made such a tremendous difference in what we've been able to do. Thank you, Tim, for your dedication, your service, your leadership. I want to devote the last section of my report. I want to devote this last section of my report to speak to the future, the challenges, and the possibilities that lay ahead for who we can be as Unitarian Universalists. In these difficult and dangerous times, we see people doubling down on a deadly status quo rather than choosing to be bold, cooperative, and innovative to meet the challenges before us. And this is heartbreaking. This is heartbreaking because it is exactly in times like these when we need audacious leaders and audacious communities that are willing to take bold risks to show a new way forward, one that is life-giving, life-sustaining, life-affirming, and justice-centered. We need to be those people, those audacious leaders and audacious communities fighting for the future and the libera liberation of all people. And to do this, we need each other. And we need to invest more fully and generously in the power and the impact of our congregations and our larger association. A future of increasingly isolated congregations just will not cut it. We need one another. We need one another to be the people that we are called to be. 
a multiracial, multicultural, multigender, multigenerational future of Unitarian Universalism, and we cannot turn back now from that vision. Our voice, our values, our ability to show up, these matter right now, and they are needed. There is more possibility ahead for our world and our humanity, but we need activists for love and organizers for justice and protectors of democracy. We are just 16 months out from the most critical election in our lifetimes. One that will have real and immediate consequences for democracy, for climate justice, for the lives of people of color, for the lives of trans people, for refugees, for women's autonomy, for the freedom of all people. This is a matter, this election is a matter of life and death. And as I said to the Minister's Association on Tuesday, this is no time to sit on the fence. This election will have direct consequences for democracy, for climate justice, for our future, for our children, for health care, for the lives of people who live with disabilities. It is a matter of life and death. And so I want to take these themes, and I'd love for the tech deck to go back to that slide. I want to take these themes of action, risk, courage, and mission, and propose to you that we you you the vote. Did you hear that? That we you you the vote. Let us, I want to see you all in your communities make your congregations into voter protection, voter registration, civic engagement, and mobilization centers. Let us show the difference, the power that Unitarian Universalists can make. You know, we already have a reputation as being the people who show up, right? Let's build the re reputation that we are the people that show up and bring others to show up. Right? Don't wait until 2020. Get those tables set up where you are finding organizations in your community that are doing voter registration, voter education drives right now. Start getting connected. Go out into your neighborhoods. Go into the community and talk to people about the issues, about your values, and about the importance of voting. We need to be getting ready right now for 2020. Start right now. Connect in your community. Who's getting voters out? Who's starting to register and mobilize? Get connected. Help your people. And if it's only a partisan party, then just make sure you have information about po both parties, right? Your people can choose who they want to partner with individually, and you can help them connect at your congregation. We have a choice about who we will be. Will we choose doubt, fear, moderation, or will we choose mission? Courage, boldness, love, generosity, liberation. I know what I will choose. What are you going to choose? Why are you here? <laughs> Where do you put your faith? Let us be bold. Let us be fearless and courageous and let us fight. Fight for what's left of our democracy and build from it. All right? Build those muscles. You, you, the vote. to serve as your president. What an honor. Thank you for this honor. It is my joy to serve with the Board of Trustees, with our fabulous co-moderators, Barb Grieve and Alandria Williams. I love you both. I'm so grateful.
that the Executive Vice President Kerry McDonald, my partner in this work, I am grateful to you. And I am inspired by all of what you, all of what we are already doing and the ways that we are embracing a deeper practice of our faith and our community and a bolder commitment to risk for solidarity and justice and a more courageous expression of Unitarian Universalism. Let's get ready, everyone. Let's get ready. Let's you, you the vote. I'm going to invite Everett Thompson, who is the Side with Love campaign manager. We are looking at how we use Side with Love and our justice ministries at the UUA to help us all you, you the vote. And Everett's going to talk to us about Side with Love. First of all, I love our president. President. And let me tell you a story about our president. When I started, before I started this great position of Side with Love as your, as your campaign manager, I was in Ohio with the o, o, well, Ohio Organizing Collaborative, but also UUJO. And we decided that we were going to uplift the work that was happening in Ohio and actually go canvassing door to door. Congregations all across Ohio came out, our congregations. Y'all came out, knocked on doors, and your president put on her tennis shoes and knocked on doors in the cold and everything else. I know that we know how to side with love. I know that we embody what siding with love is. It is more than just the theory that we speak, but I've seen y'all take great action, and I am so proud to be with y'all and be here. And when we talk more about what do we mean to side with love, I couldn't do this. I'm practicing interdependence, but we couldn't do this work without when I with Carrie McDonald, who is our right now the OST campaign director. And what Carrie has been doing is helping us create a space for us to think very big and broad about how we want to have on-ramps for us to be a part of this great work of siding with love. So that means being intentional about our disability justice, about making sure that we're in alignment with intersectional issues. And then there's this beautiful being right here next to Carrie, which is Michael. So Michael is your welcoming congregations, but also LGBTQ and trust. And what he says when he tells me, Sai with Love needs to get on the battleground to make sure we can pass the Equality Act, we say yes, and we move forward. Yeah. yeah. And then, when our president starts talking about electoral justice, we got to kick it over here to Susan Leslie, who's been here a long time. <laughs> but she is the connecting glue to make sure that whatever is happening across the region, that you use are in the forefront and that we are in right relationship. And then when they say no new fossil fuels, when we say stop the pipeline, we can't do this work without caring. We can't do this work without caring. But also, before I came here, I was down in Homestead, Florida with some really beautiful Florida UUs. River of Grass, UU Miami, yeah. Naples, you, you Naples, you, you Boca Raton, you, you Orlando, y'all showed up. We showed up and we're in right relationship. And Audra Friend, who's not here, with the Law of Resist work, said that we will align not just our theory, but our practice in our bodies with saying no more in child detention now. In child detention now. So, 
You might ask every where you going with all this? I'm going to say we have been siding with love. We have been hearing the call. We have been with partnerships with Mahente, with Black Lives Matter, with uh, with the with Sir showing up for racial justice, with the majority, with the Women's March. We have been in conversation. It ain't always been easy. It ain't always been easy when we're in conversation, but love allows us to have tension. Love allows us to sit in our contradictions and also have become, become a healing bomb. Love is what we are about and what we do, and I see it every day and throughout this hall and on the screens. So I'm inviting y'all an invitation to actually give some money to help support side with love, but really to help support what we believe in and what we want to do. This is a part of our collection, but also I just want to uplift y'all to say, we got this, and there's so much more we can do. And I'm an organizer, and so in organizing fashion, and I'm also country, uh, we're going to do a little bit of call and response, and the only thing I'm going to say is side with love, because they tell me to wrap up, and y'all just come back to say side with love with me, okay? On my, on, on my count of three. One, two, three. Side with love! Side with love! Thank y'all so much. Envelopes are coming around. And also to Elijah, may my words always make you proud. Thank you, family. climate justice resolution the baskets are still coming around so continue to give your money we have only a decade to avoid the direst of consequences of the climate crisis the 2014 General Assembly heard this call and overwhelmingly passed a business resolution on fossil fuel divestment my intention was to help you use live into their values, but it was really Bill McKibben's do the math tour in 2012 after the election that prompted our actions. The resolution called on the UUA to reduce its fossil fuel holdings and, for those few retained, to use its shareholder rights to pressure companies to take action on climate change. Climate change really uh, percolated up to the top of the issues that we were working on. When I became UUA president, I was astounded at the work that we were doing through the Common Endowment Fund and the impact that we were having when it came to advocating for greater responsibility from petroleum companies in diminishing emissions and in working for climate justice. Climate justice is a movement responding to the urgency of the climate crisis in a way that actually builds equity and justice in our societies. Our shareholder influence is enhanced by working with other investors through the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, or ICCR. ICCR started in the early 1970s and from there pioneered the strategy of shareholder investor engagement on environmental and social issues. And the UUA was there almost from the beginning in the 1970s. 
Over three decades, the faith community has catalyzed powerful investor coalitions acting on climate change. We are shareholders, and being long-term shareholders means something. And now we belong to a group of people like Climate Action 100 Plus, which is $33 trillion of invested capital, one-third of the invested capital in the world. And when we walk in and say something to somebody, they listen these, these days. And so by working together, they have a common set of concerns they put before 160 plus companies globally and they engage them, they talk to them, they, they meet with them, they have uh, uh, share research with each other. Since GA 2014, the UUA has filed or co-filed 32 climate related resolutions. As an example at Exxon, um, when we demanded a scenario plan for how Exxon was going to make a transition, a couple of years ago, we managed to get a 62% vote on that resolution, and that was just unheard of. It was really the first time at a real turning point where the largest institutional investors in the world, the Black Rocks, the Vanguards, the Fidelities, it was your mainstream investors who said, this is really important. and this company needs to produce this report. At BP and Shell and Glencore, all, th all three of those are good examples of really seeing um, targets for how they're going to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and plans that are much more assertive in terms of moving faster, deeper, um, really dramatically changing the businesses. Two years ago, the UUA joined Westpac in filing a shareholder resolution at Occidental Petroleum that got 67% of the vote. It was the first time an environmentally focused shareholder resolution had ever passed at a U.S. oil and gas company. Since then, the company has gone on and is now thinking about ways to become carbon neutral. Boston Common is the co-author of a report called Disclosing the Facts, and last year the focus was on methane. And what we found is that a company that UUA engaged with, Range Resources, has significantly moved in terms of, it, of its performance around methane. So where it used to be a laggard, it's actually improved its practices and its disclosure. Trump administration is basically overturning rules on methane emissions, rules designed to reduce those emissions. After a conversation with Exxon, they came out with a very public statement saying that they oppose that um, and they stood, they encouraged the administration to leave the rules in place. I think we're at a tipping point now. Major companies globally understand the issue of climate change and the threat it is to their business. We are more powerful because we unite our assets in the UU Common Endowment Fund and we're more effective because we work in partnership with other faith and values-based investors. The more that Unitarian Universalist congregations are invested in the common endowment, the more power that we have to advocate as a whole faith on behalf of our values. So I invite congregations to consider seriously the UU Common Endowment Fund as a place to hold their endowment resources and advocate on our values together. behind schedule. It is and it isn't. We want to make sure that we're all back here for the Commission on Institutional Changes report, so we're going to need your help. And part of the way we can do this is by using a consent agenda. So we want to explain the use of the consent agenda and what it means. The GA rules of procedure this year include the ability to have a consent agenda, which is often used by congregational meetings and our own board of trustees to group routine, informational, procedural, self-explanatory, and non-controversial, or things we hope are non-controversial, items of business. Given the fullness of the business agenda this year, the consent agenda may help this General Assembly save time and prioritize discussions on the most critical areas. We understand that this is a, the first time we will be doing this, and so we're going to take a straw poll for each item. The items that pass the straw poll will be combined into a singular motion, and the item or items that do not will be taken separately. 
We'd like to remind everyone that while we can decide to debate everything, it also means that we may not have time for lunch or going to the bathroom or workshops or anything else as planned. I'm just saying, folks. So the following proposed bylaw amendments received no amendments in the business mini assemblies. Accordingly, your board of trustees recommends they be added to and passed as part of our consent agenda. Change the word final to full in section 5.11, board of review, line 180. Section 7.6, ministerial fellowship committee, line 191. Don't worry, Greg's gonna help us understand what this all means in a minute. Section 11.5, termination of fellowship and administrative suspension, line 195. And in section 11.7, appeal, line 200. The full text of each change can be found on page 71 of your program book. Also, to remove the phrase in odd numbered years from section 5.2, Election and Appointment, line 290, found on pages 70 and 71 of your program book. To remove the sentence, the Secretary's decision shall be final from section 9.9, .9, Supervision of Elections, line 341, and replace it with the following text. The decision of the Secretary may be changed by a two-thirds vote of the Board of Trustees. These changes can be found on page 75 of your program book. To make changes that normalize the use of electronic voting while preserving the ability to vote by mail for elected offices in sections 9.1 and rules G 9.13.1, G 9.13.2, G 9.13.3, G 9.13.4, and G 913.5. The text of those changes can be found on pages 72 through 74 of your program book. And finally, we recommend the inclusion on the consent agenda of the business resolution for the merger of the Blue Channing District with our Unitarian Universalist Association, found on page 75 of your program book. Where'd Greg? Greg, at the amendment mic. Thank you very much. I recognize Greg at the procedural, at the amendment mic. There we go. The change of the term final to full fellowship in sections 5.11, 7.6, 11.5, and 11.7 come to us after joint processes of discernment and recommendation from the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association and the Ministerial Fellowship Committee a subcommittee of your board of trustees. The changes are intended to reflect a thinking around ministry where professionals can continue to learn throughout their service to our faith. Removing the phrase in odd numbered years from section 5.2 brings practices around appointments in line with how we hold elections. The proposed change to section 9.9 .9 changes ultimate accountability for elections to the entire board of trustees. While normalizing the procedures, processes, and formats for voting for elected offices in our association in section 9.10 and rules G-9.13.1, ah, G-9.13.2, G-9.13.3, G-9.13.4, and G-9.13.5 allows for greater flexibility while maintaining the ability to independently verify election results. The G in front of a G rule stands for General Assembly and means that the rule was created by the General Assembly and in turn requires additional action by the General Assembly in order to be changed or removed. And finally, the business resolution for the merger of the Balu Channing District with our Unitarian Universalist Association reflects the desire of this former district to conform with our association's move to regionalization. The Balu Channing District held its final meeting earlier in the spring. 
the law of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts requires a two-thirds affirmative vote of the member congregations of our association to authorize this change. The mini-assembly process revealed that all of the above changes were not controversial. Your Board of Trustees, therefore, recommends that we approve these changes by adding them to and ultimately passing a consent agenda. So here is how it's going to work. Do you have your orange cards? Oh, yeah. So move that the changes receiving an affirmative straw poll outcome be added to the consent agenda. So we're going to go one by one. If you would like the changes to be on the consent agenda, you will raise your orange card. If not, you do not raise your orange card. Alrighty, so here we go. Final to full fellowship, 5.11A1, 7.6, 11.3, 11.5, and 11.7. Okay, we need to wait for offsite. I recognize the person at the procedural mic. I've got a, a statement from Sally Jane Gellert, Central Unitarian of Paramus, New Jersey. Is it a procedural question? She says it is, yes. Okay. I request that we remove the consent agenda from Rule 1. I believe that there were too few people in the mini-assembly for it to truly give consent of the body and the proceedings there were extremely confusing to off-site delegates, with no clear page reference, no discussion of the topic before we were asked to agree to have items moved to a consent agenda. So can I answer Sally? So we're doing it in the main hall now, so that we will actually have the whole body's opinion. So that's why we're doing it this way too. Okay. Yes. I recognize the person at the procedural mic. Hi, Erin White from the Fourth Universalist Society in the City of New York. Um, I had a point of clarification, mm -hmm. which was to ask whether what um, Greg read from the amendment mic mm -hmm. is different than what is printed in here, because I think I heard him mention something about the two-thirds. That's a whole, we're not even there yet. Okay, because so I, I was unclear for me when he was talking, if he was talking about that being part of the consensus agenda or... It's a separate line item later. That's a separate line item we're about to get to later on down in the okay. consent agenda. Okay, that was my, that was my point okay. of clarification, because I was confused. No. <laughs> Thank you. I recognize the person in the procedural mic. Uh, Carol Gray, Unitarian Society of Florence in Northampton. Uh, I'd like to remove item four, five, page three, from the consent agenda, please. So we are just, so I want to explain the process one more time. So we are all clear. This is, we are going from each different item, right? So we're starting with one, which is around 5.11. And we are doing a straw poll to see what the body would like. So we're not even, are you asking about 5.11 or another one? Board authority for we're not even. We're not there yet. So right now, we are at 5.11, okay? First one on the page. So, and I wanna say, we're doing a straw poll, which is a very different system than all, what we've done before. Is, with, just to clarify, mm -hmm. if any one individual wants something pulled out of the consent agenda, then the body can debate it, isn't that, is that right? If the body decides to not have it on the consent agenda, then it will not be on the consent agenda. But no one can offer a reason why they don't want it on the but consent agenda? Right now we are on a different one. I know, but I'm just <laughs> process-wise. Can we offer a reason why we'd like something pulled from the consent agenda? If you want to discuss it, we have to take it off the consent agenda as a whole body. And then discuss it. But there's a straw vote without anyone knowing a reason why something should come off the consent agenda.
Patricia Parcells, University, Univers yeah, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Corvallis. I want to know how one votes no when one is in the hall. So we are going to do yes and, and no. We're we going to do twice I, now. I apologize. We have, we have had a yay vote with no nay. I votes. apologize. I will not do that again. We will not do that again. Thank you. So can we go back to the one we were doing? Is that okay? So everybody listen, please, to the one that's coming up, <laughs> right? So let's start with again. Final to full fellowship, 5.11, 7.6, 11.3, 11.5, and 11.7. If you would like it on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Okay, please put them down. If you would not like it on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Okay, and we're gonna wait. It's 92 to six, so this is on the consent agenda. Thank you, we did a thing. All right, number two. Remove an odd number years, 5.2. If you would like it on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. If you would not like it on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Okay, 94% approved, 6% no, so that is also on the consent agenda. Okay, number three, modernize for electronic vote and clarify election preparation by secretary, rule G9.13.1. If you would like this on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Please put them down. If you would not like this on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Okay, 94% to six, so this is on the consent agenda. All right, number four. Modernize electronic vote and randomize order number of candidate names, rule G.9.13.2. If you would like this on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Thank you, please put them down. If you would not, please raise your voting card. All right, we're gonna wait for the off-site delegates. Thank you. 91% to seven, and two abstentions. I recognize the person in the procedural mic. I just have another question about Robert's rules and how they, I've never heard of doing straw polls where the people that are in a disagreement don't get to say anything. Um, is this part of Robert's rules? And if so, it, that straw polls like this are part of Yes, we do straw polls often, actually. Is it, what does Robert's rules say about what is incorporated in the consent calendar? You want to do that? Go ahead. Hi, Kathy Burek, uh, Board of Trustees. Uh, we are not limited to Robert's rules. This body can operate how it chooses to. <laughs> body can create its own rules. Which we do. Okay, so number six, mail paper ballots. And I know this is really new for people. It's very new. Did you have a procedural? Yeah. I recognize the person with the procedural mic. Are you calling number five now? Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Procedurals. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Berger from UU Congregation of Wyoming Valley in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. She says the numbers listed on screen are only the off-site participants. Yes. Yes. Uh, 
Christy Stockman, Unitarian Universalist Church of Corpus Christi in Texas. I would like to question the order of the consent agenda. Okay. <laughs> I mean, is this order printed, so. I recognize the speaker at the, the procedural mic. Uh, hi, Ann Schneider from Arizona. I'm looking at Robert's rules. It says that if a member requests that an item be moved off the consent agenda, it must be moved. Any reason is sufficient to move an item. A member can move an item to discuss the item, to query the item, or to vote against it. That, that's Robert's rule. So here's a quest, here's a thing. So we actually did rules of procedure, and we voted on rules of procedure earlier. And so since we understand that Robert's rule sometimes is a system that's grounded in white supremacy. And so are other systems of decision making. So I'm just saying, we, we actually did pass rules earlier. I think this rule is in the interest of democracy. This person has requested it be removed from the okay. consent agenda. It ought to be removed. So when we, so can I say a thing? I can say a thing, right? So we had a mini assembly and someone wanted something removed and we did. We actually, in a, so I wanna say this, in, a, in the mini assembly, there was a there was strong objection to something on the consent agenda and it's no longer on the consent agenda. So we actually did follow the process. Okay. So I just want to say we did move some things and we have another amendment that's coming that's not on the consent agenda because we actually did follow their process. Okay, I just want to point out, in this case, Robert's Rules is a more democratic procedure. That's all. We, that's an opinion, not a fact. <laughs> and, so, and so I want to say this debate is not allowed in the procedural, Mike. It's just not. So I mean, I, you can... Uh, we've got to move. Am, am I recognized? <laughs> yes. I request that the body allow Robert's rules to apply for. Uh, our, so I'm sorry. Our, if, I'm sorry if I may just we finish. We the rules already. If, if I just request that the body, the body decides, and in the interest of our principle about democratic values, I request that the body allow Robert's rules to apply for the board authority for elections uh, just to allow someone who may have a concern to voice it in the interest of democratic values and our principle on democratic values. So I would like to make sure everyone even understands what this is about. So in the original bylaws, the secretary had final say. One person had final say. What we're actually trying to do is to say one person does not have final say the final say is actually a larger body of people. That's what this one is actually about. That's it. It's to say one person shouldn't have final say. Instead, it should actually go for a larger body of people, for this one. A, a, colleague, a colleague told me I should move for suspension of this straw poll rule to ask for Robert's rules to apply for this particular vote. Okay, we can vote on it. Okay. If people would like to, to move to suspend the rules for this, to use Robert rules instead of a straw poll, please raise your voting cards yes if you're in favor. If you're not in favor, please raise your voting cards. And we're gonna wait for off-site. So 77% oppose. I can't even see that. It's called bad eyes, y'all, sorry. Yeah, so it does not pass. All right, so we're on number five, I think. <laughs> Modernize for electronic vote and remove on a ballot. 
9.13.3. If you would like this to stay on the consent agenda, please raise your voting card. Please put your cards down. If you do not, is this about this one? Okay, go ahead. I recognize the person in the procedural mic. Um, Reverend Grayson from Clark Lake, Michigan. I just would like to request that the moderators call for abstentions in the house as well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So round number five, if your vote is nay, please raise your hand, your card. So again, this is for modernized for electronic vote and remove on a ballot. I recognize the people with procedural mic. Can you repeat what you just at what we're voting on? Well, yes. Thank so you. we're voting. We're adding to add to the agenda, modernize for electronic vote and remove on a ballot. Okay. If you are voting to keep this on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. If you would like to take an off the consent agenda, please put, raise your voting cards. If you abstain, please raise your voting cards. Okay, we're waiting for off-site. So 90% in favor, nine opposed. Well, hold on. 88% in favor, 10% opposed, and 1% abstained. Okay, now we're on number seven. No, we're not, we're on number six. We're on mail paper ballots. Procedural question about mail paper ballots. We've got a number of, of in the queues. Are you ready to hear some of those? If, are they actual procedural questions? Yeah. Okay. At least the first one I've got. Craig Morrow, Wise Unitarian Universalist of Portland, Oregon. The UU Ministers Association's leadership recently issued a message about this proposed change from final to full. So we're on mail paper ballots. Okay. We've already passed that one. Okay. We're on, number, we're on mail paper ballots, which is rule G.9.13.5. Huh? We did four already. We're good on the no, we, didn't. we didn't? I skipped four? Oops. Okay, I'll go back. We're going to do six, then four. Six. Tell me what six is, please. Six is mail paper ballots. Okay. Rule G.9.13.5. Okay, y'all. Okay. So, y'all, are we ready? Grace is a thing, right? Yeah, so I, I'm trying to give all of you grace. So, if you could give it to us, that'd be really lovely. It's a lot of little numbers. <laughs> Can we yes. I recognize the person from procedural mic. Thank you. I'm Deborah Wilbrink from First UU of Nashville. I want to thank the co-moderators for their grace. And um, I noticed there's a, there was a question from the off-site delegates. Well, just a statement that they cannot see how the votes are going out here. I wonder if there's a way for the camera to show, you know, to show the votes. Yes. So that the off-site delegates can know how it's going. We can do that. Thank, Thank you. you. But if now we can say it if the camera can't do it. I recognize the delegate the procedure mic. Uh, Bertie Welty, Humboldt UU. Uh, a clarification when you're, all of these screens are showing only the off-site people. And yet when you're talking about how many people are for and against, we're not um, the co-moderators, thank you for a phenomenal job under stress, but it would be helpful to me if you'd also say it's preponderant here. Yes, we can do that. definitely do that. Thank you. I recognize the person at the procedural mic. Amanda Schuber, UU Church of Huntsville. With due respect to our fabulous co-moderators, I do believe that you may have a different numbering system on your sheet than we have been passed out. So I would like to ask that there's some confirmation made on what we have versus what you have. Thank you for pointing that out. While we're scrambling to get the right documentation, I also just want to name that, that the straw polling that we're doing is just about putting the pieces on the agenda and not voting in support or not support of the item itself. 
I read his person that received her mic. Yeah, this is also off site. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm reading for Abigail Humphreys, First Unitarian Church of Toledo, Ohio. Uh, rule one of rules of procedure allows the moderator to propose a single consent agenda for items that received no proposed amendments at the appropriate mini assembly. Those of us who attended the appropriate mini assembly were not allowed to propose amendments for any items that were listed on Friday's agenda as being the consent agenda. We were not allowed to ask any questions or ask for any clarifications on items. We were only allowed to vote on whether we were in favor of adding an item to the consent agenda. We were misinformed at the beginning of the mini assembly that there would be time to ask questions about the items after we voted. Since there's been no opportunity for discussion or an opportunity to propose amendments, I believe the proposed consent agenda goes against the intention of rule one. So that would be truly except someone did do an amendment from that mini assembly. We, are, we took that one off the consent agenda and we're actually going to debate it later today. So, we, so I mean, I, I hear that and we actually have one that did get taken off and we're going to debate later today. Christy Stockman of Unitarian Universalist Church of Corpus Christi. May I be recognized? Very simply, I am asking as an off-site delegate, may I be recognized? Yes. To, to say what? Oh. Allison McLeod, I apologize if I mispronounced that, Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of San Diego, Solana Beach, California. We want the co-moderators to ask the tellers before voting if there's any uh, procedural person in the queue line. Okay. Thank you. I recognize the person in the procedural mic. Erin White, uh, Fourth U New York City. Um, just a further point of clarification regarding the numbering um, that you've been referring to. There's only bullet points in our um, agenda in the book and also in the most recent thing I can find in the app. Um, so uh, maybe there is a handout, but we didn't take the handouts because of the sustainability um, encouragement. So I think uh, unless, unless everyone is going to take the handouts, referring to them by numbers is just making it a little more confusing to follow than anything. So if we could just refer to the specific um, bylaw and the, what it amends rather than number four, number six, or number... For me, it's helpful because I'm trying to go in order. So I can, I can try not to go in I can try to not do that. Well, I, can, I, I, I completely can. understand. It's just that it's confusing for us since we don't yes. have a numbered list. I'm going to try to... We I'll, got bullet points only. I will try not to do that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, here we go. So we're going to do rule G.9.13.2, which is modernize the electronic vote and randomize order of candidate name. All righty, rule G-9.13.2. If you would like that place on the consent agenda, please raise your orange voting card. That overwhelmingly, there's a lot of people. If you would not like it on the consent agenda, please raise your voting card. If you would like to abstain, please raise your voting card. Okay, 90% approve, 4% no, and 3% abstain, so that overwhelmingly passed. All right, we're back to mail paper ballots, which is rule G.9.13.5. Again, this is mail paper ballots, rule G.13.5. Huh? Point four. Sorry, point four. Thank you. Oh. I recognize the person at the procedure. Thank you. 
Abigail Humphreys, First Unitarian Church of Toledo. Respectfully, Alandria is incorrect. At the mini assembly, we were informed that the bylaw change regarding elections was not on the consent agenda. Based on final agenda, that bylaw change and preliminary fellowship were not on the consent agenda. Therefore, we were allowed to propose amendments and have discussions on the election. We were not allowed to have any discussion on any of the other bylaw changes. Thank you for clarification. It happened in mini assembly two and there were no amendments or changes. Okay, so back to G9.13.4. If you are in favor of keeping this on the consent agenda, please raise your voting card. Thank you. If not, please raise your voting card. If you abstain, please raise your voting card. Thank you. We're gonna wait for off site. Okay, 92% in favor, off site. 6% opposed, off site. And 2% abstain, off site. So that also overwhelmingly passes. All right, clarify voting at General Assembly. I think this one is 0.5. Rule G9.13.5. If you are in favor, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your voting cards. If you would like to abstain, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. We're waiting for off site. Ninety-five percent approve, five percent oppose, and no abstentions. This also overwhelmingly passes. All right. Rule, no, nope. bylaw 9.10, conduct of elections at large. If you would like this to stay on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. If you would like to take this off, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. If you abstain, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. We're waiting for off site. Eighty five percent approve, eleven percent oppose, and then four percent abstain. So this is also overwhelmingly passed. Next, 9.9, .9, supervision of elections. If you would like for this to stay on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. If you would like to have this leave the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Abstain. Thank you, and we have a question in the procedural mic. Abigail Humphreys again, First Unitarian Church of Toledo, Ohio. I attended mini assembly two. We discussed the preliminary fellowship and then ended the mini assembly two. No one informed us that we could discuss any issues other than preliminary fellowship during mini assembly two. Also, the offsite delegates do not currently have an active moderator in the room with us, which is why I'm at the mic for the third time. So we did that one. We did all the consent agendas in mini assembly number one. That's why. So then if you look, so many, the consent agenda and one item was in mini assembly number one. Preliminary fellowship was mini assembly number two. So can we get off site, please? Tech, tech deck, can we get the off site vote for that last vote, please? Oh, it's already clear. Okay, we have to take the vote again. So 9.9 .9 supervision of elections. If you approve for this to be on the consent agenda, please raise your voting card again. Thank you. 
If you are opposed, please raise your voting card. Thank you. If you abstain, please raise your voting card. Thank you, and now we're gonna wait for off-site. So 91% approve, 6% oppose, and then 3% abstain, that also overwhelmingly passed. Last one, Baloo Channing District merger. If you would like this to stay on the consent agenda, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. If you oppose, please raise your voting cards. If you abstain, please raise your voting cards. Thank you. We just have to wait for off site. Ninety five percent approve. 3% do not approve, and 2% abstain, so this also overwhelmingly passes. Thank you. Take a steady breath in with me, would you? Steady breath out. Change is hard. You want to make the motion? Sorry. So just for uh, transparency's sake, I had an allergy attack, and so I'm on albuterol and epinephrine and a lot of things right now. So if I go really fast, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Love you too. Okay, so again, we moved that the changes receiving an affirmative straw poll outcome be added to the consent agenda. A motion to add the items we have just considered through the straw poll has been made. Is there a second? Yes. Seeing many seconds in the hall. The motion has been moved and seconded. The consent agenda motion is not amendable. Is there further discussion? And before that, I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. Christy Stockman, Univer excuse me, Unitarian Universalist Church of Corpus Christi, Texas. There seems to be a number of delegates who have not been able to review the consent agenda. Is there some way we can suspend the consent agenda until those delegates who were in mini assembly two have a chance to review it? All of the items that are on the consent agenda are in the program book, are available through the app, have been available since the final agenda was printed a few weeks ago. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, thank you. Carl Pononen from the UU Church of Greater Lansing in, in Michigan. I am confused about what the motion on the floor is. We just, we just took um, straw votes to add everything to the consent agenda, and now there's another motion to add everything to the consent agenda? Yes. Carl, I appreciate that. So to be clear, the, des the design of a consent agenda is to help us move our business forward quickly. <laughs> this is new for us, all of us, this is new. We, the board's intent in doing the straw poll, given the rules that we passed earlier today, allow for the co-moderators to remove or place anything on the agenda that we deem appropriate, and certainly we use the guidance of our fellow board members and legal counsel. The straw poll was to give us a sense of what the collective we in the power of we wanted. So that's what we just finished doing. Now is the more official type stuff. The motion is to accept the consent agenda. It has been moved. It has been seconded. It is not amendable. So is there any discussion about that? OK. So let's take the vote.
got to love the parliamentarian and legal advice council. Thank you both. I'm going to go down the list of the things that are on the consent agenda before we try voting on it. I'm going to do it in shorthand. On the consent agenda is section 5.11 under Board of Review, section 7.6 Ministerial Fellowship Committee, section 11.5 Termination of Fellowship and Administrative Suspension, section 11.7 Appeal, section 5.2 Election and Appointment, Rule G9.13.1, Election Preparation. G Rule G9.13.2, Order of Candidate Names on a Ballot. Rule G9.13.3, Write-ins Prohibition. Rule G9.13.4, Mail Ballots. Rule G9.13.5, Voting at General Assembly. Section 9.9, .9, Suspension of Elections. It's a long list. Section 9.10, Conduct of Elections at Large. In consultation with legal counsel, your co-moderators are removing the Blue Channing District merger from the consent agenda, and we will take a separate vote there for reasons we'll tell you later. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, thank you. Car Carl Pononen again, UU uh, Church of Greater Lansing, Michigan. Um, the co-moderator just said these are on the, these items are on the consent Senator. agenda. I think technically they're not because we're about to vote to put them on the consent agenda. Or, or am I completely confused? You're, you're a step behind us, Carl. I'm a step but behind I, you. I love it. I'm okay. glad you're paying attention to us. These have been put on the consent agenda. The next vote we will take will be to pass the consent agenda. Okay, did we take the vote? No, actually, you're right. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I right. thought we skipped right. a vote there. Okay. The next vote we take will be to put, put these on. proposed items onto the consent agenda, and then we will take a vote to pass the consent agenda. Exactly. And to be clear, to be, to be clear, we need a 50% majority to pass. 51%? <clears throat> to put things on the consent agenda is a 50 Mathematically, that doesn't. A majority vote. Let's go with a majority vote. This is not a debatable, this is a non debatable item. Right? You ready to vote? All in favor of the items listed prior being on the consent agenda, please raise your cards or vote online. In the hall, it is an overwhelming majority. Those opposed and those abstaining. And we're just waiting for the online tally. Ninety percent in favor, eight percent opposed, and two percent abstaining. Again, an overwhelming majority, which means the collective power of we has an overwhelming majority. Gotta love the branding. So we have a consent agenda. The consent agenda itself is not amendable, nor is it debatable. So therefore, we will take an immediate vote. The consent agenda must receive a two-thirds affirmative majority in order to pass. Two-thirds majority. All in favor of the items on the consent agenda, please raise your card or vote online. We have our dear board members and tellers all looking for the two-thirds vote. We can put our cards down and those opposed, raise your cards or vote online. And those abstaining, raise your cards or vote online. All right. So we're all going to 
converse to make sure we've got an agreement on what the numbers we're seeing are, and I invite you to introduce yourself to the person next to you. So just for people to know, off-site was 89% of support, 10% opposed, and 1% of thanked. So here's the thing. It passed. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go... I was going to say we're going to go back. We're not going back. We're going forward always moving forward. We, we need a motion for this. Yeah, but we need somebody to move it. Okay, so we're going to take a moment to um, address the Blue Channing District merger um, motion. It's already on the floor. Do y'all feel ready to vote? Are there folks who want to discuss it? All right, we're ready to vote then. So all in favor of accepting the Blue Channing District merger as printed in the final agenda? Please vote. If Put your cards down. If you're opposed, please vote. And if you are abstaining, please vote. How in the world So it's 95% in favor online, 3% opposed, and 2% abstain online. It overwhelmingly passes. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. I'm baffled. You took the uh, Balu amendment out of the straw. Did that automatically place it on the floor, or did someone have to move it? It automatically placed it on the floor. So if you removed two things, they both would have been on the floor? In concurrent order. Oh, this is just bizarre. It's hard. It's really, really hard. We're used to doing business using one set of rules in one book that we think has been fair and allowed for democracy for ages. And we're faced with the reality that that book, and I say this as somebody who loves studying it, it's not adequate to being and creating and governing in a just world that we imagine. All right, here we go. So now we are about to vote on things that were not in the consent agenda. Just reminders. Ready? I recognize the person procedure, Mike, even though we're not at a thing yet. I know, this, this is general. Uh, Rebecca Berger, UU Congregation of Wyoming Valley, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Would the moderators ask people not to clap at the announcement of the result of contentious votes, please? Yes. Please do not clap at the result of contentious votes, <laughs> which is important. A few quick reminders, you must be a delegate to speak at a mic, and if you do speak, you only have two minutes. 
and you can only speak once if there are others waiting. In order to make sure that we all get a lunch break before the next set of things we must do, which is the Commission on Institutional Change, if you would, before approaching a mic, please consider whether what you are going to offer is a new perspective or repeat of something offered earlier. We will continue to have a couple of minutes of informal discussion with the countdown timer tracked on the screen by the speaker timer. Remember, this does not count towards the 30-minute limit. The 30-minute minutes of debate time does include time devoted to discussing any amendments to the proposed amendment. Amendments. Amendments must have been submitted for consideration at the appropriate mini-assembly. There has to be 15 minutes of discussion before amendments to the main motion can be considered. Again, there are 30 minutes total. After 15 minutes of debate motions, you can actually vote to table or refer if that much time is needed. Motions must come from the procedural mic. A motion to call the previous question is in order once 10 minutes have expired and there are people, there are no, and there are people at the pro and the concern mic. Once five minutes has expired and no one is at the pro or concern mic, then the motion to call the previous question is in order. And again, time taken at the procedural mic will not count against discussion time. Remember that delegates can suspend the rules at any time by going to the procedural mic. There are delegates joining us online, and so submitted statements will be read by the teller, as we've already seen. Are we ready? All right. So I need my little, this is, I have the wrong sheet, sorry. So we are talking about preliminary fellowship, section 11.3. So move that the proposed bylaw amendment to article 11, section 11.3, to change from final to full fellowship. As I can do it. We just want to. Yeah. You know, we got all these things, and that's not where we're at. Other side. This one? Sorry, y'all. Too many pieces of paper. Okay, sorry, y'all. I recognize the person receiver mic before we actually do what we're supposed to do. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. There we go. Uh, Richard Senges, Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Santa Rosa, California. I respectfully disagree with the rejection of my previous procedural point asking about when items can be asked to be pulled from the consent agenda. Even if it is not dealt with now, I would like that point of process reviewed. I've served as a parliamentarian for a university senate, one that has also local rules that supplement or modify Robert's rules of order. I think we missed something there. Thank you. So one of the ones that got removed from the consent agenda was the bylaw amendment to section 9.6 to increase number of petitions for nominations to 50 congregations from at least three of the regions of the association. So that is what we are parked to talk about now. I need someone to move. Um, I move that uh, section 9.6 uh, be amended so that the uh, petitions require 50 uh, endorsements from congregations uh, from at least three districts. You have the precise language in front of you. It's from, it is 50 congregations from at least three regions of the association. Do we have a second? Okay. Can, if you would like to, to, to debate this, 9.6, please raise your voting card. If you're ready to debate this, please raise your voting card. You're not ready to talk about it. You don't understand. We have to actually take a vote to talk about it, because we did the second, so now we need, in order to talk about it, please raise your voting cards. I know. Thank you. Recognize person the procedural, Mike. Uh, yes, Carl Ponen in Unitarian Universalist Church of Greater Lansing. I'm not familiar with this rule that we have to vote. If we have a, a 
Motion in a second. Now, this isn't in Robert's I'm, I'm rules. I'm tired. Was, I, it in, was it in the rules we passed this morning? Because I don't think it was there. Carl, I could be wrong. I could be, I could be wrong. No, I could be wrong. We can both be wrong. I'm fine. I need help. We're good. I need help. So I'm sorry. I need help right now. They're helping me. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We are ready for people to come to the pro concern mic if you have a if you want to say a, in favor or anything in concern. I recognize the person with the procedural mic. Hi, Mary Early Zald, First Unitarian Universalist Nashville. I don't know what we're looking at. Okay. So where can we find that, please? We're page hearing 75. page 75. We're looking at 9.6. Looking at 9.6, which is about... 9.6 is to increase the number of petitions for nominations to 50 congregations from at least three of the regions of the association. Thank you, Greg and Alandria. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. I recognize the speaker at the procedure mic. Thank you. I'm Tara Anderson from the UU Church on Whidbey Island. I would like to know the background of why this change. It feels less democratic than what we had, and I'm sure there's a good reason I'd like to hear. Sure. So I'm going to recognize the person at the pro mic who was on the presidential search committee with me. Thank, thank you. I'm Matthew Johnson, a minister in Rockford, Illinois, and uh, the co-chair of the Presidential Search Committee. Uh, that committee and some other folks involved in elections met to review our procedures, and some of the changes you see today came out of that. The petitions are about increasing the number of grassroots participation necessary for someone to bypass the official search committees. So if, if you decide that the search committee, which has been elected by the delegates, has made a grievous error and you want to put your own name in. We've increased slightly the number of congregations that need to support that um, so that you can't do it with a small group from a small area but need support across the association. That's why. And that's why I urge a yes vote. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Uh, hi, my name is Joseph Turner from the Sacramento congregation. And the increase from doubling it from 25 to 50 and then including one from each of the three regions, it sounds like it's making it a little bit harder because that would require any candidate to have the means to travel and get around to all those different organizations. And that would be you know, quite difficult for someone with limited means but has a lot of you know, reason and will drive to make change. Thank you. I recognize the person at the proceed. Oh. I recognize a delegate to the concern mic. I just feel as though that this is uh, not as democratic as it was in the past, that even though the nominating committee was elected, if, again, as a gentleman before me mentioned, that uh, we ought to be able to have more grassroots participation. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Peter Candace, Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Low Country. Thank you. I recognize a delegate, offside delegate at the concern mic. Beth McGregor, you know, there's a, I'm trying to recognize the offsite delegate oh, at the concern sorry, mic. Sorry. Uh, yes, thank you. I am I'm speaking on behalf of Dave Spites, spelling S P E I G H T S, of the Evergreen UU Fellowship in Marysville. His statement is the proposed increase in the number of endorsements seems to raise a higher barrier. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the concern mic. Hi, Beth McGregor, Unitarian Church of Sharon, Mass. I was also on this elections task force. And it's not a con, it's not a con, it's not an opposition. But I think there needs to be a little clarification around how, the, the, what the current system is, the committees, whether they're nominated, whether they're elected, whether they're appointed by the board, who make the decisions and the recommendations. 
because it's not exactly elected by the whole, at least not for the moderator search. Uh, and I think this needs a little work. So I have some concerns about it. I recognize, whoop, I recognize the offsite delegate from the concern mic, and then we'll go to the pro mic. Thank you. <clears throat> this is on behalf of Sally Jane Geller of Central Unitarian Church in Paramus, New Jersey. I oppose this amendment as it makes it more difficult for people to be on the ballot. Given that the search committee chooses only two delegates, it is not a slur to them to choose to run by petition, doubling the number of congregations, fellowships, societies needed is less democratic. I recognize a delegate at the pro mic. Heather, Heather Millar, uh, Unitarian Universalist Church of Annapolis. I went to the mini assembly yesterday and it was explained that the people who get nominated by the nomination committee go through several steps, uh, several interviews uh, to get on that. And so this was to make um, it more balanced that somebody could, would have to get widespread support before they could be put on the ballot by petition. Uh, if that's correct, I think that's fair and I support the amendment. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Yes, Erin White from Fourth Universalist in New York City. Um, it's not really a complete opposition, more as a concern as to the timing sometimes that's involved. Um, and I know that, for instance, the last presidential election, there was a candidate that withdrew, and then another candidate, I think, was added by petition. Um, and they had a relatively short time period to do so. And so by raising the threshold uh, to 50 congregations, and especially to three regions, that may impact that. And so I guess it's a concern about the specific circumstances. Um, so that's one. And the second thing I would say is, I'm not aware that there are a um, like overload of, of candidates being added by petition, such that this change really seems necessary. Uh, it isn't as if we had 10 or 15 people um, that were added by petition. So it kind of seems an unnecessary change to address a concern that might in the future present itself, but doesn't actually exist currently. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Does somebody have a procedural mic? Yeah. I'm sorry, I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Lee Pardee, uh, First Unitarian Brooklyn. Just to clarify what the prior speaker, I think, was saying, is it correct that our current president got onto the ballot through by petition with only 25? I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. So to answer that question again, Matthew Johnson from Rockford, Illinois, yes, because the procedure required that. Um, if you can't get 50 congregations to sign on and aren't already connected with people in those places. Man, okay, yeah. that you're okay, but there okay. will be a future rule is likely to come that would allow a search committee to nominate a replacement candidate. We have more years before we need to consider that for next election. So that problem will be solved by separate means. Thank you. I recognize it. Hi, uh, Elaine McMillan from Horizon Unitarian Universalist in Carrollton, Texas. Uh, thank you. In the past, when there's been a pro and a con mic, if there was nobody at the pro mic, then nobody could speak from the con mic. I know it's now you've changed it to concern, and so I don't know if those rules have changed or what. Now there's somebody at the pro and the con, but. Uh, a few minutes ago, there was nobody at the pro mic, but we kept on going on with the cons both here and off-site. Our time limit has not expired. Um, in the past, yes, I know. if there was nobody at the pro, nobody, you know, then you just sat down. I mean, I remember Denny Davidoff coming up and speaking against something she was in favor of, just so that somebody could, you know, speak from the mic from the opposite side. We're just so, doing it a little differently right now. That, I'm asking, is that yeah. because it's pro and concern, or? It's trying to be nice. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so I recognize the delegate at the pro mic. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't. I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. Or Orlando Montoya, Unitarian Universalist Church of Savannah, Georgia. Uh, is it within order now to call the previous question? I suggest that it has been 10 minutes of, of debate. Is that, the, yep, is that time? It's, yes. It's in order. Is it, I, I move to call, if it is within order, yes. If, if you're saying it is in order to call the previous question. I call the previous question. Okay, is there a second? Okay, if you are ready to call to order the previous question, please raise your orange cards. Thank you. Those opposed? All righty, any abstentions? We're going to wait for the offsite. Eighty six percent in favor. 10% opposed and 4% abstain. We need to confer. So we, there is overwhelmingly passed to call the question. And there's somebody on, offsite at the procedural mic. Christine Hager, River Road, UU Congregation, Bethesda, Maryland. Calling the previous question requires no second or debate, requires two thirds vote. Right, okay. thank you. Recognize the person at the procedural mic. My name is Anaí Quiroz Romero and I'm a member of the Chalice Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in the Conejo Valley. Um, can we at least, hear the same number of pro arguments and con arguments? It depends, there may not be the same number. Because we already heard a lot of con arguments. We're, right. And there's something that I learned at the mini assembly that hasn't been said. Okay, we've already called the, I don't know what you want, what's your. Um, what I'm saying is we did not hear the same number of pro okay, arguments and con arguments. Thank you. All righty, so we've now called the question. We've had a second. All those in favor of increasing the number of petitions for nominations to 50 congregations from at least three of the regions of the association, please raise your voting cards. All those opposed? Abstain. We're waiting on the offsite. So 65% in favor, 35% opposed, and 5% abstain. So we have a two-thirds vote. So we've added, increased the number of petitions for nominations to 50 congregations from at least three of the regions of the association. We have a little conference down at the procedure, Mike, so we're, we're waiting to see if that's going to materialize. I recognize the delegate at the procedural, Mike. Matthew Shinneman, DLRE from the UU Congregation of York. I have a point of clarification on calling the question. Mm -hmm. um, in the rules of 
uh, business that we voted on earlier, calling the question said, if there are people at the pro and con mic, you have to wait 10 minutes of elapsed time. If there are no people, you have to wait five minutes. As there were people at the con mic still, we had to wait the full 10 minutes. The motion clock had not reached 10 minutes, so is it 10 minutes of elapsed time regularly or on the motion clock? Because if it's on the motion clock, calling the question was out of order. Ten minutes of debate based on the motion clock itself, because the motion clock stops when there are people at the, or the procedural mic. Correct. Ten minutes on the motion clock as displayed on the screen. It was the call of the moderator that ten minutes had elapsed. Okay. The clock on the screen said 22, which means that only eight minutes had passed. I understand. A ruling was made, and we decided that 10 minutes had elapsed. I, I do understand. People agreed with the ruling at the time. I understand that it was out of order. Is there someone in the hall that thinks the outcome of the vote would have been changed by two more minutes of debate? Okay, I, I see a few people. Do we want to allow two more minutes of debate? All right, let's take a quick straw poll on that. If you would like to allow two more minutes of debate to reconsider this motion, please raise your cards. Go ahead and put those down. If you are opposed to adding two more minutes of debate in order to reconsider this motion, raise your cards now. Any abstentions? Go ahead and put those down. The off-site vote looks like 61% opposed, 32% in favor. It's changing a little bit, but that's all right. 7% abstain. You do not want more time to debate in order to reconsider this motion. So the previous motion is passed as we did. So we have increased the number of congregations needed. We recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. Thank you. Christine Hager, River Road UU Congregation in Bethesda. It is not two-thirds. Two-thirds is 67 percent. Can, can you give us a little bit more detail on that question? So what's happened is that we, we need to start saying off-site. So it's not 67 percent. Well, now we read the numbers for the off-site. We were reading just the off-site, not everybody. Gotcha. Thank you. We, we are passing two-thirds based on what we see here in the hall as well as what's on site. All votes are uncounted unless someone requests that they be counted. Or it's close. Or it's really close. You cannot request that it be counted now, Carol, because we've already passed that. All right. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Hi, Gwen Wages, UU Congregation of Tupelo, Mississippi. I think I'd like a little clarification. I don't think people are aware that you're actually counting in the audience. Can we get people say that somewhere, that you're actually counting the votes in the audience? Because I thought it was a little closer, that vote, but I really couldn't tell. So we are not counting. We do not count votes unless there's a request to count them. We, it's an uncounted show of cards. That's what our rules of procedure say. We, we look to see if it looks like two-thirds or looks like a majority, unless someone asks us to count. On that issue, can you tell me when do people ask for a count on the vote? Dur during the vote, you would ask that. So you could come to the procedural mic to ask us to count the vote. Um, if so long as we're taking the vote, a motion would be in order for a counted vote. And if it looks really, really close, we will do a teller count. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Erin White, Fourth Universalist, New York City. Um, I guess it's a, a point of clarification or information. Um, I thought previously that it was um, in order to question whether or not um, a two-thirds majority had been reached after a vote was, was taken and declared, and a decision was declared if, if we felt that it was not, um, that two-thirds had not been met. Um, because I, too, saw 
enough op opposition that I'm not sure that two thirds was reached. And so I, I'm not sure how I would do that during the, the vote. I almost don't see how I could do it without you first saying two thirds have been reached and then me saying, I don't feel that way and then requesting a count. So th those are two separate things. You can request that the vote be counted while we're taking the vote or you can request that we reconsider the vote after we've taken it. Which are you asking for? I'm, a, I'm, I'm asking you for clarification of what you've said, which is that the only time that I could properly request you count the vote is during the vote? Is that? Yes. If you disagree with the determination we make afterwards, you can have us reconsider that vote and have it be counted. Does that make sense? One is about whether the vote we're taking will be counted. The other one's about whether you trust the outcome of that vote. Okay, so I am asking then to be considered um, based on uh, not feeling confident that two thirds was actually. Okay, I'm hearing, it sounds like the delegate is making a motion to reconsider the vote. That, nope. No, a, motion a, a motion to count, okay. Thank you, Tom. All right, there has been a motion. I thought you said it, I couldn't ask to count. <laughs> we're working with you. Tell her we're working with you. We're, we're, we're working with you, we're working with our parliamentarian. No, I'm trying to work with you too, and that's, that's why I, I, I just want to count. Yeah, I, I hear you, we're, we're trying to help you count, and we're trying to see if the body wants to count, because okay. that is the body that makes the decision. So I, I understand. Your, your motion is in order. Thank your motion is in order. It needs 100 plus one delegates for us to count that vote. 99. 99, all right. Plus I, one. Plus one. <laughs> what, what, not 100 plus one, that's friends. <laughs> Work with me. I'm tired, we're over time. We actually only have five more minutes that we can devote to this or else we are going to break labor laws with our tech deck. Are, and there are two other announcements that have to be made within those five minutes. So we're gonna move through this as quickly as possible. If you would like us to count the vote that we just did, go ahead and raise your orange voting card. All right, it passes. So we're gonna go ahead and count that vote. I'm gonna re-announce what we're voting on. So give me just a moment. All right. we, we also have offsite. It's in favor. And so we definitely have more than 100 in favor. So we're gonna go ahead and count that vote. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Can the moderators please on each vote say whether we need a two thirds or a 50% majority? I think that each vote was unclear. That, that makes sense. For, for this one, it was not actually about a vote, it's about seeing how many people wanted us to reconsider and count. So that was not, too, yeah, I understand. I, I'm just clarifying in case other people didn't understand that question. We were seeing if people wanted us to recount. In the future, we will also make sure we say whether it needs a plurality majority vote or whether it needs a two thirds. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Go ahead. Uh, Reverend David Carl Olson, uh, lead minister at our congregation in Baltimore. We violated one of our own rules by the eight minute versus 10 minute thing. We can fess up about that, but indeed, had there been sufficient time for people to speak for me and others to speak at the pro mic, I think there might have been a, a clearer sense of the of consensus, and I'm gonna say that to block that fuller conversation by jumping to calling the question, to me, is um, white supremacy in action. I mean, it's again, the, it's, it's about control rather than about risking us being with each other in a richer, more relational, honest way. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, and I wanna say a thing. We asked for assistance 
around whether we had reached time, because we can't just see the clock by ourselves. And so we were wrong. It was not white supremacists. I'm not going to have someone tell me to do white supremacy. But we, were, we also can admit that we were wrong. OK, thank you. OK, so we're going to go ahead and redo this vote. Again, let me make sure I'm on the right page. We're considering 9.6, 9.6, which is an increase from 25 to 50 congregations in order to have a nomination by petition in three regions, all right? We are considering 9.6, which would increase the number of congregations you need from 25 to 50 in at least three different regions. And the tellers are on account this one. So on this one, if you're in favor of that, go ahead and raise your orange card and keep it raised until your teller tells you that they have counted your vote. While we are taking that vote, I wanna make two announcements. One, we will have the first hour of tomorrow's general session from nine to 10. We will receive the reports from the UU Women's Federation and the UU Service Committee and discuss and debate the statement of conscience. So tomorrow morning from 9 to 10, as well as the other pieces of business that, we'll, that we will still need to discuss. That will allow us to finish our time today. The second is that we have an important announcement from the Commission on Social Witness about the actions of immediate witness because of deadlines existing today. And here he comes. My name is Meredith Garman with the Commission on Social Witness. Um, we have actions of immediate witness to vote on. There are five that have been submitted, and we have voting going on right now to reduce those five down to three which we can adopt. The five title are titled, Build the Movement for a Green New Deal, Back from the Brink, Immigration and Asylum, Overthrow Corporate Capitalism, and support our First Amendment rights to boycott. The process is that among those five, we must choose three. You can vote on any three of those five with your GA app, or by going online, or by dropping by the CSW booth. Voting closes at 2 o'clock tomorrow, and the three top vote getters will be submitted to, will be nominated to be submitted to the agenda at tomorrow afternoon session. I think that's the process. I think that's what you need to know. All right, we're ready to take no votes. No votes on 9.6 if you are opposed to increasing the number of petitions that you need. Go ahead and raise your orange cards now and keep them raised until your teller tells you that you can put your arm down. I recognize the off-site delegate at the procedural mic. On site. I recognize the off-site delegate. There's an off-site person in the queue. Sally Jane Gellert, uh, Central Unitarian per Church, Paramus, New Jersey. I respectfully, respectfully request that the reports go after the voting tomorrow as if we run out of time, it is critical that the business gets done. Sally, will we consider that request? I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Does the vote we are currently in the middle of require a majority or two-thirds? This requires a two-thirds vote to pass because it is an amendment to the bylaws. Still in the middle of this vote, I see some cards still raised. I recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Uh, thank you, Carl Ponenin, UU Church of Greater Lansing. Um, I raise this point since we're, we're count, still in the count. Um, some of us have been uh, lining up at the procedural mic and waiting to be uh, recognized by the chair before raising our procedural issues. I'm just concerned because there's a few, uh, occasionally folks have been um, yelling procedural issues from the floor and um, have, have gotten a response from the, the moderator or the person in the moderators. Um, so that's kind of, kind of rude to those of us who are trying to follow the procedure and wait to be recognized. 
uh, if the moderators could just uh, could uh, make sure that they recognize somebody uh, before that they um, entertain their, their procedural issue. Thank you for that call back into our shared expectations. I really appreciate that. Please speak from the microphones. The appropriate way to speak to the entire assembly is from the microphones, not by yelling. Especially on your level, most of the people can't hear you. We can hear you because we're a little bit elevated, the sound travels. We are ready to take abstentions. If you would like to abstain from the vote on 9.6, go ahead and raise your orange cards now. Wait until your tellers tell you that your vote has been counted. This counted vote will be the last item of business we do for today inside of a general session. We are past time. While our tellers are counting, let's go ahead and pop up the off-site vote and close that vote at this time. Please do remember to return at 1.30 for our conversations. Make sure you come back at 1.30 for our conversations here in the general session hall. We'll have some breakout groups after that. Commission on Institutional Change would love to help guide us through conversations we need to have about the future and present of our faith. Okay, can we see the offsite vote? have the off-site vote. I'm waiting for our usher teller crew in the back there to bring up a number for us and then we'll add these numbers together and make sure we know what we have. recognize the delegate at the procedural mic. Hi, Carol Bunting, also of New London. A point of clarification. I thought I heard Barb mention we had another session tomorrow morning. That's not in the program. It's a, it's a both and. I'm a fan of the both and. So tomorrow morning, there was a, what we affectionately call the stripey sections, right, from 9 to 12. We're going to take the first hour of that to continue the business of today. And we, the board and administration, will work together to shrink the other, the, what would have been three hours of programming into two hours so that we can do it all. We're going Thank to need you. your help tomorrow. Thank you very much. We're adding the on-site and off-site numbers right now to make sure that we know the full percentages. opportunity to practice your steady breathing. <laughs> Y'all, while they're doing that, can we give a big round of applause to the tech deck who's staying a little bit late for us?
yeses were 454. The noes were 100, or let me start over. I'm reading the wrong column. It's going to be great. Thank you, EVP. The yeses were 535. That is the combined total of the off-site delegate and on-site delegate vote. The noes were 217. The abstentions were 16, which gives us a total pass of 70.9%. The motion clearly passes. So again, people, please remember, do not applause for contentious votes, because it, it's actually not the spirit that we're trying to be in of love. Thank you. There being no further business to come before us and in accordance with the schedule as amended set forth in your program book, I declare that this general session of the General Assembly shall stand in recess until 9 a.m. tomorrow, Saturday, June 21st, 2019. Please come back for the 1.30 conversation with our Commission on Institutional Change, who has worked for two years to help get us some good information. <laughs>